lipid issues, you know, actual heart disease or stroke risk, or they're on the metabolic side, insulin, blood sugar, metabolic dysfunction, you know, dysfunctional metabolism. All these words really are capturing the themes we've been talking about. Lipid, glucose, inflammation, insulin. Those are the people that you're thinking about for this plan. And what you're really doing is building a lifestyle prescription. And for our patients who have cardiometabolic issues, we're going to really take advantage of those features of our cardiometabolic food plan and then take them a step further to not only give a low glycemic impact, anti-inflammatory, plant-based kind of nutrient source, but then how can we tailor it according to other parameters of this patient? And then how can we really help this patient implement it when they step outside your office and have to enter into their environment, which may or may not be set up for success? So first things first, there is a practitioner guide that you must, 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 must take advantage of. This is like the scriptures of nutrition, as I would say. And it has so many resources in here, but of course they are of no use to you until you know about them. So please, please, please consider slotting a time in your calendar at the end of this talk that says, this is when I'm gonna look at the practitioner guide and the patient guide. So this is gonna give you the how-to. So in case you miss something I'm saying or want more detail, please refer to this practitioner guide for the cardiometabolic food plan. Now, let's just say that you wanna do the first entry level use of this food plan. Well, I would say grab the one that just says flat out cardiometabolic food plan. You'll notice it has all these specialized foods that have been selected to help with cardiometabolic conditions. And it's so much better than just saying, hey, eat less carbs, eat more plants, you know, eat healthy exercise. That's just not enough specificity. So taking it a step further, just give them a blank food plan. It doesn't have to be personalized to another level. Sometimes this is the way I started when I first was having an insurance-based practice and 15 minute visits. It was just Here's the food plan, start eating from this list. And these are serving sizes as well. Now, when I got a little more savvy, I decided to take it to the next level, which was not only to give them the food choices in terms of the quality of the ingredients that we're looking for, but then now it's the quantity. So let's say that you just have the ability right now in your office setting to just do some guesstimates, guesstimates on size and caloric targets. So the way I look at it is it's kind of like a small, medium, large, right? You can estimate size and weight and kind of put a small, medium, and large. I'd say a small person might be a petite, you know, person like me, five foot two on a good day, maybe 100 to 150 pounds. Um, then you might have a medium framed person or a medium built person who might be, uh, I don't know if you can say petite man, but, you know, I'll say a uh, uh, a lower end of the spectrum male or maybe a medium to large female might fit in this medium category. And then we have the large uh, category of caloric targets, and that might be a stockier person, whether male or female, that you might want to give 1,800 to 2,200. So that might be the first kind of personalization. Let's just give you some caloric guided, quantity guided food plan options. So what's beautiful is, is that we actually have, just like I was showing here, those already built out. And if you look closely at them, it tells you how many servings of each category should be in each specific small, medium, large food plan. So you don't have to do that calculation. Now, if you want to take it to the next level and you have uh, a BIA or a bioimpedance analysis machine, you can you know really understand specifically what is their caloric uh, burn rate? And then if you want to modify it. So let's just let's see how we can modify these things. We're going to do a case study. Here's Bob. He's a 40-year-old male. He's you know not happy with his weight. He's got some issues like ankle pain. This has been going on for a while. He's 245 pounds, five foot five. His, you know, he's got some cardiometabolic issues starting here. You look at his numbers and you go, oh. This guy could benefit from the cardiometabolic food plan. 
So if you look at the practitioner guide, you can actually calculate some caloric recommendations just from the data points that you have from an ABCD assessment. So again, this is here in your practitioner guide. I'm gonna go through a quick version of it. So what we're trying to do is calculate what would be the resting metabolic rate for Bob. So you can plug in the numbers into the formula and it would estimate out at 1,965 calories. Now you can take it a little bit further. You can personalize based on his activity level or if he has goals for weight loss or muscle gain. So if you wanted to, you can look at some of the examples I have here. If you take that 1965 that you calculated, then you can do multipliers to increase his allotment if he's exercising based on the intensity of his exercise. Or, so that's where you would add the calories to support the extra calories he might want because he's exercising. Now, if you're interested in having them lose weight or to gain muscle, that's the other way you can use these numbers. So you can see that 500 is kind of the average number that we plus or minus for a male. And 250 is what we generally plus or minus for a female. Now, I know that that may not apply to all males and females because we have very petite men and we have maybe larger framed women, but you use your judgment on what you think is the most appropriate uh, plus or minus based on size, frame, gender, and goal for either fat loss, then you're subtracting calories, or if they're trying to gain muscle, maybe they've lost their fat and they're trying to increase muscle mass, then you may, in addition to some proper exercise prescriptions, add on calories. So again, you can take Bob's number that's calculated and say, oh, he's got a light activity level that calculates out to 2633, but he wants to lose some weight as a male. We're going to subtract 500. So now he's at 2133 for weight loss. And again, I might stick with Bob on the weight loss goal first before we get to the muscle gain for him. But again, that's all within a conversation to have with Bob. So remember that if we just did the calculation by formula, you would have gotten 2025. If you did it out a little bit more complex, you hit 2133. You can see they're kind of close. So if time is a factor or if you just don't feel comfortable doing these calculations, a simple formula on the front end calculating the resting metabolic rate would maybe work for you. Now, what do you do with that information? Well, you can then take from your toolkit the functional medicine prescription, kind of a lifestyle medicine prescription, find the nutrition section, and you can mark off cardiometabolic food plan, mark off the spread that you want of carbs, fat, and protein. And then you might even say, hey, I'd like this person to fast two days a week. Hey, and I'm assessing this person at the 18 to 2200 range. So if you have a health coach or even your front office staff, they can pull out that food plan, appropriate food plan, and then guide on the checkout. Again, remember that you have this practitioner guide that will help you understand what's in each category and how to personalize the servings per day if you decide to get a bit more personalized with the caloric targets. And remember that within this food plan, there's some MVPs, most valuable players is what I'll call them, that have like super nutrient power, if you will. Um, so as you're listening to me talk, think about, hey, how would I actually make this work in my practice? Do I want to just have the generic food plan? Do I want to have the small, medium, large? Do I want to do calculations? How will I get my structure, my health coach or my checkout team to be able to follow through when I mark these things off on my prescription? Okay. Remember that you can kind of be semi personalized or you could be full out personalized by having complete customization by putting in servings of different food groups. Like if you're leaning keto with your cardiometabolic, okay? Remember that the goal for this cardiometabolic food plan is really to be able to personalize for unique clinical cases and unique patients, but it still serves the general need of cardiometabolic food um, signals for our patients with these issues. Again, schedule that time to get to know this practitioner guide because it is full 
of personalization techniques, whether it's how many servings for each size. And then it also is coupled with this patient guide. So please feel free to consider how you can make this available to your patients so that they have it to couple because it has recipes, it's got menu plans, shopping guides, recipe indexes. I mean, it's really chock full of the things that slow us down in getting nitty gritty about the cardiometabolic food plan or nutrition in general. So I hope this was really useful for you. There's something in here for everybody. Remember, you just have to get started on something. Something is always better than nothing. So start with the cardiometabolic food plan for your patients. And I am sure you will start seeing the science be beautifully put into action. All right, so now Yusuf is gonna come up next. He's gonna talk a little bit about how you can use genetics with the diet prescription. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for that awesome talk on tailoring the cardiometabolic food plan. Going a little bit deeper, today I'll be talking about how we tailor the cardiometabolic food plan in patients based on their APOE genotype. So how do we customize it just a little bit further? So what is APOE? APOE is a class of apolipoproteins. It is produced in the liver, macrophages, and astrocytes. It is required for the clearance of chylomicrons and IDLs. It mediates cholesterol metabolism, and it is the principal cholesterol carrier in the brain. Now, there are three possible genotypes. There's APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. And what happens is you're going to get one from each parent. So you're going to end up with a combination at the end. So you'll be either APOE3, 4, APOE2, 3. So based on what you got from mother and what you got from father, you're going to have that com you're going to have a combination. So APOE2 and APOE3, honestly, there's a lot of information online on like blogs and whatnot, but there's not really some good evidence on making specific dietary changes in these particular genotypes. So un unfortunately, we just don't have the data to confidently say how to, how to modulate or how to change or customize the food plan based on these genotypes. The best I can tell you is follow the biomarkers and every patient is individual. But what about APOE4? 20% of Americans have at least one APOE4 allele. If you have APOE4, you have an increased risk of mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. You have an increased risk of hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and coronary heart disease. And if you smoke or if you drink, you have a worse outcome with this genotype. The interesting news, just with uh, rele being relevant to the times, it increases the risk of COVID-19 severe infections or severe COVID-19 infections if you have, in particular, APOE44. 43 or 42, they didn't really show it, but 44 you have more of a chance of having more severe COVID infections. So with your patients that you already have their genetics on, this might be a nice way to take a look that if you know their APOE44, risk stratify them even more when it comes to COVID and try to protect them even more. So the, this was independent of whether they had dementia or underlying cardiovascular disease or diabetes. So that, that COVID-19 risk was, didn't have anything to do with that. And back to genetics, you'll see tomorrow in the genetics lecture, lecture I will, I'll be discussing this a little bit further, but there's no such thing as bad genes. Usually something is, helps one thing, but it will, and it can hurt others. If you have APOE4, it may be protective against malaria and who knows what else, what other benefits it would have. And interesting about APOE4 is in, in a study where they tried to give them DHA supplementation, they found that it was harder to get the, the DHA in the brain higher with APOE4. They could elevate it, but not as well as whether if you had APOE2 or 3. And this was like supplementing with, um, this was supplementing with DHA. Other studies were showing that if you do DHA and EPA together, that the levels did not respond as well. So you didn't get as high of a response of the omega-3s if with APOE4 uh, versus if you had E2 or E3. 
So, so the interesting thing, though, is that the study looking at the omegas in the brain, that was actually, that was actually just supplementing with DHA. We have all kinds of new research now on the benefit of EPA only omega-3. There's even a main name brand product that is EPA only. And I tend to use the EPA only omega-3 in these patients. If you look at, if you look to the right, you see that EPA ends up becoming DHA. So if you start increasing EPA, what I've seen clinically is you start increasing EPA, both EPA and DHA will go up. What about APOE in diet or the food that you're consuming? Well, when they looked at genetically modified mice where they took APOE out, they found extreme hypercholesterolemia with a high fat food plan. So when the mice were fed higher fat diets, they ended up with having this extreme rise in high cholesterol. Why is this relevant? Because APOE4 does not function as well as APOE3 and APOE2. So that kind of told us, gave us a hint that maybe this would affect us, if humans, if, if humans ended up consuming a higher fat food plan. So what about humans? Is there human research? There is some. In a UK study, they found out that if they gave patients with APOE4, if they switched them from saturated fats, if they decreased their saturated fats and they increased their lower glycemic index carbohydrates, they found that it lowered their LDL and it lowered their APOB. So this is kind of a clue that maybe we want to decrease saturated fats, even the so-called healthier saturated fats in these patients, the ones with APOE4. So the Berkeley Heart Study. Berkeley Heart Lab was bought by Quest. It's now called CardioIQ. It's one of the original advanced lipid testing labs. And they had an observational study where they saw the different effects in these patients with APOE4 different effects based on different dietary modifications. So what did they find? They found that if they gave them fish oil, it lowered their triglycerides, it lowered their small density LDL, their HDL, and it increased their LDL. So their, their HDL was decreased, but small density LDL went down and their triglycerides went down. Now, clinically, uh, we just need to have more studies on this, but clinically, since I use a lot of high EPA omega-3, I have not found that it increases LDL and, it, and I have not found that it decreases HDL. I found that it will lower triglycerides, small density LDL, sometimes lower LDL, and it can keep HDL about the same. But these studies were, were back when they were supplementing with more of an even DHA EPA ratio or EPA DHA kind of ratio. But that's just something to be observant at. The, the, of the study showed giving them fish oil, smaller, small density LDL, uh, or lower small density LDL and lower triglycerides. Uh, they found that if they gave them a lower fat food plan or a lower fat diet, they found that it lowered their LDL and small density LDL. A moderate fat diet lowered their LDL, but it increased their small density LDL. So that's not a good sign. That's not a good thing that'll happen. And they found that with moderate alcohol consumption, it lowered their HDL and it increased their LDL. So completely opposite of what you want to happen with a moderate alcohol consumption diet or food plan. So APOE4 and herpes simplex 1 in the brain, what they found is that people with APOE4 on cadaver biopsy studies, they tended to have more HSV or herpes simplex 1 virus in the brain, in cerebral tissue. So we, they also believe, or the research also indicates that patients with APOE4 have a higher susceptibility to getting the herpes viruses. And remember, herpes simplex one virus is typically what causes cold sores. What about HSV and dementia? Well, the, the, the research indicates that, pay, that HSV does increase the risk of dementia. And what the, what the thought is, is that just like the herpes virus can come out and cause cold sores, it can internally manifest and you can get these episodes where HSV becomes active in the brain, and that can cause some of the pathogenesis of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease. And there was a study that showed that if you gave them antivirals, if you gave patients with dementia anti, or, or if you gave patients antivirals, that it decreased the risk of getting dementia. So what do we do with APOE? If you have APOE2, 
cardiometabolic food plan, APOE3, APOE4, all of them just, you can start them on, if they're on the SAD diet, the standard American diet, then, then putting them on the cardiometabolic food plan is just a good idea. It's going to start shifting them in the right direction. What about additional consideration if they have three, four, and four, four? There, there's a couple reasons why you may want to jump in on this. Whenever you customize a diet to patients' genetics, they like it more. So if you can say, listen, we have your genes and we know that you would do better if you had lower saturated fat or if you, you don't do so well on alcohol, X, Y, or Z, it makes them pay attention more because now it's personalized. It's not like, hey, everybody just eat healthy. It's more personalized to your genetics. So, so that would be a reason to start this from the get-go. But like I said, just get them on the full cardiometabolic food plan and, 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 and they should do better. But what, what I would start with is put the whole thing in perspective that this APOE 3, 4, and 4, 4 is not a death sentence. It's just a clue on how you respond to your environment and what we need to kind of watch out for. It does not mean that you are going to get Alzheimer's. As a matter of fact, the majority of people with Alzheimer's do not have APOE 4. It's just you have a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's if you have a APOE4, and that's where functional medicine comes in to risk stratify them. We, we will recommend a lower simple carbohydrate diet, a higher glycemic index diet. And I say diet and food plan interchangeably, but really with patients, the pearl is call it a food plan. Diet has negative connotations. So I personally try to avoid diet because yes, most, a lot of people listen, say, okay, okay. But some people are triggered by it. You have people with food disorders and people with bad experiences with diets, a lower fat and a lower saturated fat food plan or recommendation is something to, to consider and consider being more aggressive with omega threes. And if you don't believe my clinical experience, watch those omega three levels, put them on a DHA, EPA, omega-3, and then also try an EPA-only omega-3 and see if something, kind of do an experiment and see if things shift. If they start shifting for the better, then told you so. So strongly advise against alcohol and, and monitor these patients for cognitive decline. There are different tools that you can use. Many mental status is a little bit too early for the, uh, or it's, a, but by the time a mini mental status is abnormal, they're a little far gone. We do the CNS vitals test in our office, but find a test, a cognitive test that you can do for in your, in your office that you could do readily and kind of keep an eye on their mentation. So if it starts to decline, you're jumping in way before you have a major problem. And because of the, the, because of the issue of them not being able to deal with the, with herpes virus as well. And because herpes virus may play a role in getting dementia, you may consider lysine supplementation. Arginine can deplete lysine. So if you end up eating a lot of pumpkin seeds and a lot of almonds and whatnot that have higher amounts of arginine, you may want to counteract that with lysine. And the research suggested that you need about two grams of lysine a day. But just remember, every patient is, is individual. Don't just Throw everybody on lysine if they have APOE 344, 34 or 44, but just something to consider. And now a bonus IFM board style question. We have a 56 year old black male who presents with an LDL of 165. He drinks a glass of red wine every night for his health. He just read a book by one of your favorite functional medicine authors that encouraged him to eat a high healthy fat diet. He is loving all of the coconut oil and the grass-fed beef, and you check his levels, and that you do advanced lipid testing because you're fantastic. You're a functional medicine provider. You don't settle for just regular cholesterol. And guess what? You find out that his small density LDL is 60, very high according to this lab that you just used. His A1C is 5.7, and his APOE status is APOE 3.4. What is your next step? A, encourage a trial of a low fat, lower simple carbohydrate, no alcohol food plan. B, call the author of the book and you let him or her have it. Say, listen, you're causing problems with this thing. C, put him on a statin. 
D, inquire about a family history of dementia and screen the patient for dementia. E, both A and D. F, all of the above. So go ahead and put it in your chat box. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Is it D? Is it E? Is it F? It is better to put a letter in the chat box and get it wrong than not put the letter at all. All right, let's see if you're right. Both A and D. Unless you want to call the, uh, unless you want to do B and call the author and uh, start an enemy. So final thoughts on APOE and nutrition. There are many pieces to the puzzle. Do not be dogmatic and say you have these genes, so you must do this. Just realize there's so many different genes, so many different variabilities. Uh, realize this, that it's not that, that race can have something to do with the way that APOE is affected as well. For example, they did a study that found that people in Nigeria, Nigerians, actually had higher amounts of APOE4, and the APOE4 actually did not increase their risk of dementia. So there's other pieces of the puzzle. Monitor biomarkers and continue to adjust the plan. Up next, Dr. Stone will be talking about how to deal with people with high triglycerides and high LDL. Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you today after this great uh, introductory talk about the cardiometabolic food plan by Dr. Saxena and followed by Dr. Alleman's exquisite summary of APOE. What I'd like to talk to you now is how do you take the abnormal lipo lipid findings that you see on your profiles of your patients, those biomarkers that all of us check, and how do you adjust the cardiometabolic food plan? What are some of the highlights of adjustment of metabolic food plan that you will do for your patient in response to their lipids? Let's first review a few things of what we know about how modulating the diet modulates lipids. First, we know that if you just go from a standard American diet to the cardiometabolic food plan and you just remove the trans fatty acids, if you remove the trans fatty acids, then you will see a decrease in LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and you'll get an improvement in HDL. To say it another way, if your diet is high in trans fatty acids, you'll have a higher LDL, you have, will have higher triglycerides, and you'll have lower HDL. So what else do we know about just modulating the diet a bit? If you have, if you have longer chain fatty acids, longer chain fatty acids that are not polyunsaturated, you'll have an increase in your LDL and triglycerides, and you may have an increase or no change in your HDL cholesterol. On the other hand, you know, we focus a lot on the shorter chain fatty acids in functional medicine. So if you have shorter chain fatty acids, less than 10, carbons, you'll have a lower LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and increased HDL. So you can see with the cardiometabolic food plan, just by addressing with the patient their fat source, the fat type, you can begin to impact LDL cholesterol without and triglycerides, really without any other modulation other than dietary habit. And then finally, we know the data early and some of the most recent meta-analysis of changing simple sugars in the diet, we know that that can in its own right increase LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and you get a lowering of HDL. So let's put this all in context. What do we want to do for our patients to, to decrease the risk of coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic coronary fat disease? We want their LDL cholesterol to be in a range that's lower. We do not want that LDL to be oxidized. We want the HDL to be higher. And if we can get triglycerides down through dietary change, then that gives us a clue that there not, might not be dysfunction in the insulin metabolism. Then finally, with omega-3 fatty acids or adding omega-3 fatty acids or monounsaturated fatty acids, we'll get a lowering of LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and we'll get an increase in HDL cholesterol. This is really associated with the uh, reduction in cardiovascular risk. And it is independent 
of lipid levels. How is that? It's because if you have inflammation, if you have inflammatory drivers, those inflammatory drivers, independent of your serum lipids, will increase your risk of atherosclerotic disease. So let's look at three kind of conundrums when it comes to looking at this biomarker lipid panel. So let's say you have a patient of, for example, a 55 year old with no family history of cardiovascular disease, um, but they do have a family history of elevated lipids. Their LDL is elevated to 201, triglycerides and HDL looks good. So from there you can say, you know, do they have metabolic syndrome? Not as likely. They would fall into your pattern A lipid uh, profile. The TMAO is borderline, so that's not going to be a driver. So the question is, are they a cholesterol overabsorber? Or do they have thyroid issues? Or do they have subclinical thyroid issues, which in its own right can drive some aspects of the LDL? The other thing to think about is, what are LDL's, LDL's purposes? LDL is a precursor to all your androgens formed in the mitochondria. LDL actually binds some of the lipoprotein, uh, lipopolysaccharides from your bowel. LDL is key for it, when they are large particle LDLs, they are key and non-atherosclerotic. If they're small particle and they become oxidized in the presence of elevated glucose, then it increases your risk. So already just by looking at a person's elevated LDL level, we need to ask ourselves: um, are they at increased risk? So when we look at the diet, we want to balance animal and vegetable proteins. What's the advantage of this? The advantage of this is what goes along with animal proteins versus vegetable proteins. It really comes to the saturated fat and the fat content. By balancing the proteins, by balancing the proteins without the fat, you don't have as much oxidative stress after a meal. Thus, even if you have an elevated LDL level, you have less chance of having increased oxidized LDL. Additionally, we focus on increasing soluble fiber. Just increasing soluble fiber slows the absorption of the cholesterol in the small intestine. Just by getting adequate fiber in the over 20 grams, 20, 25 grams a day, in all honesty, you can markedly diminish LDL levels. So think of all the different vegetables, all the different ways, ground flax seed, that you can increase fiber in the diet. The next is avoiding added sugar. Added sugar in its own right, as previously described, has been associated with increasing LDL. There is a little bit of controversy when you look at different meta-analysis as whether this makes that much different in atherosclerotic risk. We just know that by changing, switching from simple sugars to more complex carbohydrate, you get a reduction in LDL levels. The next, why do we emphasize omega-3 fatty acids? Well, as outlined in the previous slide, we know by increasing the omega-3 fatty acids, and omega-3 fatty acid-rich foods, you are going to shift not only triglyceride levels, but you're also going to decrease LDL. This fifth item, increasing dietary sources of folate, may not necessarily make intuitive sense. However, think of the B vitamins, the magnesium, associated with all the dark green leafy vegetables those influence one carb metabolism. If you have elevated LDLs in the presence of homocysteine, which homocysteine in its own right is pro-inflammatory, then you will have a feed forward inflammatory trigger in your cardiovascular system. So that's a quick summary on some of the changes you can make. And of course, it's explained a lot more in the cardiometabolic 
food plan guide. What about your person who has normal LDL, but when you look at advanced lipids, they have elevated LDL particles, or when you look at further evaluation, they have plaque in their carotids or plaque in their arteries. And they look at you and say, doc, what's the deal? My, uh, I have normal cholesterol, my LDL is less than 100, and what is the problem? Why do I have cardiovascular disease, subclinical disease? Well, that is because these particle numbers are in the presence of some inflammation. So what do you do when you have this LDL discordance? Between 20 and 50% of people who have heart attacks have LDL discordance, meaning their LDL is in the range we want, but they have a feed-forward-driven atherosclerotic condition. So it's really important to look at the particle numbers and get advanced lipids so you can really begin to dial in their interventions. Well, what are the simple things you can do with diet? Again, balancing animal and, and vegetable protein is key. The other thing is when you take in vegetable protein, what does that vegetable protein usually travel with if it's with food? Well, it's with fiber. So that takes you to your focus on increasing soluble fiber again. Now it's interesting, the plant sterols themselves. For example, you can take a supplement of beta cytosterol or you can increase plant sterol rich foods and you will get a drop in the particle number. We want that particle number to be less than 1,000, and you can very effectively do that for your patient. So we focus on the phyto, phytonutrient polyphenol-rich foods, which have been shown also to lower particle number. Though you may not get that much of a shift in LDL, it may drop five points, 10 points in normal range. If you look at particle numbers, the particle numbers markedly diminish. So think of color. The next one is emphasizing omega-3 fatty acids. They help bring down particle number. And again, avoiding uh, added sugars. Mainly because when you have an elevated particle number, you're really at increased risk of oxidative, um, oxidizing that LDL and increased risk of intimal inflammation. So that's a summary of what do you do when you have the LDL discordance. The third and final patient type is how do you respond to somebody who just has elevated triglycerides? We know that first thing we look at with elevated triglycerides is I ask them how much they're moving. Are they exercising? Then I think about, do you have insulin resistance? So if they don't exercise much, they have elevated triglycerides and they have insulin resistance, we're gonna put them on a low glycemic impact diet which you can easily adjust in the cardiometabolic food plan. Removing or limiting um, fruit juices and uh, elevated alcohol intake, eliminating simple grains um, and shifting your starchy vegetables um, also does impact, impact your triglyceride level. Usually when somebody has elevated triglycerides without a lot of the other uh, elevated LDL and elevated, uh, and elevated total cholesterol, you want to make sure those triglycerides, as Dr. Elliman talks about, are less than 400, 500, less than 499, because if they are greater than 499, you have to think about familial hyperlipidemias, which in all honesty, um, are somewhat amenable to diet changes, but not as much as they need to be. But we know it's rich in the literature that if we're taking two grams twice a day of essential fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, many of our patients will have a marked diminishment in their triglycerides, often in the normal range. Clinically, we've had patients that have been at 500, 550, and through mainly just omega-3 fatty acids and exercise have gotten their triglycerides down. This is some of the changes you can make in your patient with, um, with dyslipidemia, with the current metabolic food plan. If you don't get movement, take a step back, look through the functional lens and ask yourself, do they have elevated insulin levels? Do they have any of the physical exam findings of, of insulin resistance? 
are they gaining weight when they don't, they don't want to, they don't expect to? Think about insulin resistance. If that's the case, then you'll consider doing intermittent fasting or transitioning from a cardiometabolic food plan to a mito food plan. Whatever the case, intermittent fasting is a good therapeutic trial for your patients to see if their lipid profiles change. And it's noted that it's not waiting for months and months for it to change. You should be able to see changes within four to six weeks. If you're still not getting success, take a step back, look at their medication list, um, and think about what medications might be driving up their LDL or their triglycerides. This list is exactly that. It's a list. Go back to that medication list and see. Ask yourself, could the medications be driving or limiting the improvement in their, in their LDL and their triglycerides? Take a step back. Is it some of the comorbidities? Notice in this table from the same uh, information out of the same article, look at the second half of this table, all the different conditions that your patients may have that are associated with elevated LDL and triglycerides. So when you come back around to how might you respond to an abnormal lipid panel, think about the cardiometabolic food plan, think about food first, then always go back and ask yourself, why am I not getting the response I expect? And then you'll be very well off in making the, helping the patient make the transitions in diet and lifestyle that will help improve their lipids and decrease their risk of atherosclerotic disease. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I'm so happy to be able to talk about how we can tailor the cardiometabolic food plan for increasing plant-based foods. Uh, many of you know I am a real proponent uh, for my cardiac patients of a plant-based diet. Well, one of the areas that I encourage my patients in is really to be low glycemic. And I think we can see nothing better in the vegetable category than our green leafy vegetables are dark greens. Now, of course, coming from an Italian culture, uh, we do a lot of green vegetables. And uh, for those of you who've never tried escarole, escarole is a great green. It's sort of like bok choy. Um, it just it lends itself beautiful to spices like garlic and a little bit of olive oil. So uh, we call that aglio olio, which means garlic, and oil. Uh, it is a great way to go. Uh, I like to encourage my patients to really make half of their plate their green vegetables. Uh, and I encourage them to eat seven servings a day in one form or the other. And I know that sounds like a lot, but if you can add greens to your smoothie, uh, if you can add greens with each meal, you can really start to push up the serving numbers. So one of the keys is to buy the vegetables and even if you have to buy them uh, for the week, which you know, people that work, sometimes they have to do that. And we can do some meal prep where we can chop our greens. And what I encourage my patients to do is to sit them in the refrigerator open so they remain crisp and they don't go bad. Uh, one other trick I like to do is to uh, teach my patients where they can add they're green. So for example, I think everyone knows this, it's easy to add greens to a soup, or it's easy to uh, add greens to uh, a pasta. And for my patients that won't give up their pasta, I encourage them to have a plant-based pasta, spinach noodle, a chickpea noodle, a lentil noodle. And then I encourage them on top of that to add vegetable uh, to the pasta. Uh, also with their rice dishes, I try to get them away actually from white rice, of course, and I encourage them to use cauliflower rice. And I so easy to make. You just put the cauliflower in a cuisine art and you uh, can make cauliflower rice in seconds. Uh, so I encourage them to add their green vegetables to that as well. 
And uh, one trick I think many of our patients already know uh, is instead of uh, using bread and lavash, if you can avoid all those tortillas, all those carbs, which really, to me, don't have a lot of nutritional value, um, with the exception of a true whole grain uh, carb, we can use wraps. We can use cabbage as a wrap. We could use collard greens as a wrap. Uh, we can use spinach and arugula to make pesto. Uh, lots of choices here. So we have to get the greens in, in one form or the other. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are one of my favorites. And there are some patients who have a hard time digesting uh, their vegetables. And sometimes I do have to use a digestive enzyme here uh, for cruciferous vegetables, but we know cruciferous vegetables are filled with fiber and they're filled with sulforaphane. So if we can get our patients into the broccoli, the cauliflower, the kale, uh, the cabbage, uh, even making a cabbage casserole, which can be totally, totally uh, delicious. It doesn't have to have even rice or pasta in it. Uh, just cabbage and vegetables can make a great uh, casserole. So uh, I like to encourage people again to steam or roast their vegetables. Uh, you can even chop up kale and bake it in the oven with some spices on it and make it like a snack. Uh, very, that's actually very easy to do. And it's also very easy to just put a little bit of olive oil once after it's cooked. Because remember, we don't wanna cook in high heat with olive oil. Well, we can add a little bit of ghee, which is purified butter, and it has actually half the amount of fat as butter. So uh, these are two choices I like for my patients. And I, I always get this question, uh, what can I have as a snack? And uh, these are uh, just a few of my thoughts. Um, I encourage my patients to bake apples. And if they don't want to put their oven on, I tell them they can do it right in a pot with just a little bit of water, put the cover on, and let the apple cook. And uh, for those of you who've done this, you know it's really, really sweet uh, and absolutely is a way to crave that sweet tooth. Uh, then what I like to encourage my patients to do is uh, put a little bit of unsweetened coconut yogurt on top. And you can put a little bit of nuts or seeds on top of that. And you actually have the perfect dessert. Uh, another simple option is add some almond butter. Or if they have an almond sensitivity, maybe they can add some cashew butter. Uh, you know who your patients are. But I think this is a nice way, uh, baked apple, a baked pear, uh, or just make a chia pudding, uh, which can be made with... Um, almond milk, or it could be made with coconut milk. Uh, just add some nuts or seeds on top, some fresh berries, and you have a great, great dessert. So this is sort of, for me, a way to slip in some of the good stuff. And uh, of course, an easy way to slip in good stuff is make a smoothie. Uh, and I use a lot of smoothies in my practice. So for example, when I have a, a someone who really needs to go through their detox, I'll have them do up to two smoothies a day. And the thing I think we need to be careful about with the smoothies is not to make them overly sweet, um, not to add too much of the sugary, uh, very sweet fruits, because that is going to spike up the insulin level uh, and that is going to not be uh, good in the long run. So I always encourage my patients to uh, pick a base. Their base can be water. I have some people who just like water as their base, uh, or the base can be unsweetened coconut milk, unsweetened almond milk, oat milk. Uh, you can probably tell I'm not a big fan of uh, dairy, especially for my patients who have dairy sensitivity. So again, using functional testing, we know who these uh, patients are. Uh, I do not usually use uh, unsweetened juice. It is possible. You can put a little 
uh, two ounces of pomegranate juice, for example, uh, which is high in uh, phytonutrients, antioxidants. Uh, but I usually have my patients do, a, do their base without a juice and then a low glycemic fruit like berries. Berries are perfect. And I um, try to make it easy by if they don't have fresh berries, I encourage them to buy uh, or a bag of organic frozen berries. If you like the smoothie cold, uh, then I tell them just put the organic frozen berries, a half a cup uh, in your smoothie, and that will make your whole smoothie nice and cold. Uh, of course, the next thing is to add a cup or two of vegetables. And this is really important because we don't want to fill this smoothie up with just sugar. And then for our vegetarians, especially, uh, we need to add protein. Uh, and the protein choice, again, is going to vary uh, for the individual, uh, depending on their food sensitivities and their preferences. Uh, usually with my average patients, I'm looking to get somewhere in the range of 1.3 gram per kilogram uh, a day of protein. And I need to add it for my vegetarians to the smoothie. Uh, so this can be an organic pea protein uh, or whatever uh, the preference is. And I also always add fiber. And the fiber can be in the form of ground flax. Uh, that's one choice. It can be hemp. It can be unbleached psyllium. Uh, fiber is fundamentally important to the smoothie because it fills you up. Fiber. Um, not only low is blood sugar, not only low is cholesterol, but it actually makes you feel full. So between uh, the fiber and the protein, uh, and if somebody says, I really want it to be a little bit smooth, I want my smoothie really smooth, I tell them to add a little bit of avocado, and that makes a smoothie nice and smooth. Uh, so we're getting lots of nutrients uh, first thing in the morning, which is when I encourage my patients to consider their smoothie. The other time uh, I have them consider it, it is when they say, I have a, you know, I sag down in the afternoon, three or four o'clock, I feel tired, uh, you know, their lunch, they're not, they haven't had a proper lunch or uh, they're just fatigued at that time. Uh, that's a great time to encourage them to have a pick me up. Uh, such as a smoothie if uh, it fits with their schedule. Now, there's one other thing that's not on the list here that uh, I love to do with my smoothies. Uh, it's a great way for me to get nutrients into my patients. Uh, over time, people develop pill fatigue. And for my cardiac patients, they may be on Coreg and ARB. They're on an aspirin. They may be on Effient. Uh, they're on all sorts of things for their heart. And uh, now I'm trying to add a lot of uh, nutraceuticals uh, that they may also need. So the vitamin D, for example, if a smoothie has some fat in it, like avocado, we can add a vitamin D. We can add um, a liquid omega-3. Uh, I even sometimes add uh, cholesterol-lowering agents to the smoothie, like cholestyramine or Wellcol, depending on what I'm doing with the uh, with lowering of cholesterol. So uh, you can even add, of course, uh, turmeric to the smoothie. So uh, we can get a lot of nutrients, not only fiber in there. We can add a lot of things which help for our patients that have uh, pill fatigue. So uh, we always have to think with the plant-based diet, where is the protein coming from? And of course we do not, and everyone knows this, we never encourage uh, what I like to call fake meat products that are plant-based, that look like hot dogs and uh, things of that nature. Uh, but certainly uh, tempeh, organic tofu, and uh, of course my favorite in this category are the legumes, the beans, the lentils, uh, and of course organic uh, soy. Uh, is a mainstay for vegetarian uh, plant-based diet. And uh, what I like to do is I like to uh, add the organic uh, soy 
to something that I may be preparing. So for example, if I'm making a cauliflower rice and I add those green vegetables in, I'll add some nuts. I'll add some nuts into the rice. I'll just quickly uh, pat down, break up some walnuts and add those in along with the spices. And then I'll add some organic tofu. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're getting the protein in. And again, I think that's why in a plant-based diet, this smoothie becomes really helpful. And this to me is the mainstay. It's the beans, it's the legumes uh, for a plant-based diet. And you know, there's no reason people can't be plant-based at least two out of three meals. So that's what, what I say to my quote unquote meat eaters. I say, you know, you don't need to eat meat for breakfast and uh, we need to make some substitutions. And this is where I encourage uh, some old fashioned cooking, like getting out a crock pot, old fashioned crock pot. You can take a whole bag of lentils and uh, you can make a nice lentil um, soup and add onion, add spices, add carrots, add some greens. And by time they come home at night, uh, they have a beautiful lentil soup, which is their protein for the evening. And then they can have their vegetable and a salad and then their baked apple and they would just be uh, good to go. Uh, the other uh, trick I like to use is to make bean stews, uh, again, in the crock pot. Uh, you can add all sorts of beans uh, with vegetables and let them just cook for the for the day. And when you come home, you have a nice bean uh, stew. And for those of my patients that are really super busy, I have them get um, pre-prepared, cleaned organic uh, lettuce and um you know, organic spinach, rugula, make a nice mixed bag of salad and just add beans on top with a little bit of olive oil. Very easy for anyone to do. Everyone can do this. Uh, and it's very easy to make a uh, soup and just hit it with a little lime zest and away we go. Uh, I, I think that our culture doesn't teach people how to prepare beans, how to uh, add beans into the diet. And I think we can take simple steps with our patients, uh, whether it's opening a can of, uh, I, I use cannelloni beans, which are from the Italian tradition, and I add them to my green vegetables. And they, well, again, with a little bit of garlic and olive oil, that is a full meal unto itself. So uh, we have to work with getting our patients to feel comfortable with beans uh, because the, you know the old saying, beans are good for the heart. So uh, those are just some of my tips and tricks for the diet prescription. And I really encourage you to uh, have your patients take that step toward adding more greens, adding more legumes, adding more nuts and seeds, uh, really making uh, the plant-based diet a mainstay for their heart health.